when picking up items that are being given away, sometimes you'll find that they're giving away multiple items and you have the opportunity to pick and choose which items you want to take. In this particular situation, I took a lawnmower and this very strange looking home light string trimmer. The problem is that if I had reservations about picking it up, would someone else have done the same thing? And if so, it could be difficult to sell and it may not be worth my time. In today's video, we're going to be looking at this home light string trimmer. And the problem is that I don't know anything about its condition since I just got it home from picking it up. Now, the ad didn't say much about its condition either, and I wasn't about to waste their time trying to get information from them. Besides, the information they have might not even be correct and might only serve to get in the way of finding out what's really wrong with it. Now, I'm going to try and repair this string trimmer, but yours might be a little different, so this might not work on yours. So if things are not working out for you, like in the video, please ask about it, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. The first thing I wanted to do was to try and start it, but if you saw the shorts video, I tried to do a test start when the rope got stuck while pulling on it. So I guess the next item we need to figure out is why the rope got stuck in the first place. The reason why is because without a working recoil, it won't matter if the engine starts or has any issues. Now since this is not what you would call a quality machine, the recoil is housed in the front cover instead of the back of the engine. That means we need to remove the cover and see what's going on with the recoil. After taking out all the fasteners, we're now able to separate the front cover from the engine. The strange part was that the moment the cover was separated from the engine, the recoil was able to pull all the rope back in. As you can see, once separated, I can easily pull on the handle and the rope moves in and out of the cover just like it's supposed to. That could mean the starter poles that are on the flywheel could be sticking and not letting go of the recoil. Just to make sure, I also turned the flywheel to spin the engine over a few times and I don't see any issues with it. Now I could use a light oil if I wanted to, but instead I'm going to use lithium grease on the post for the starter poles. Now to be honest, this was not the best choice and if I had to do it again, I would choose a WD-40 or something like it instead. Now after working the poles for a few seconds, I think it's time to put the cover back onto the engine and see if that made any difference. So despite what that looked like, it was a lot better. I mean the rope did eventually go back into the cover unlike last time, however it didn't do it with any grace. The one thing I will say about this engine is that it has some of the highest compression I've ever felt from an engine in a long time, so I'm wondering if there's a lot of carbon buildup on the piston that might be causing it. After taking out the spark plug, you can see it's covered in dirt and oil, so there's a good chance this engine could have been running on a fuel mixture that was too heavy with oil, and that oil could turn into carbon on the piston. Now without the spark plug in the engine, you can see it obviously has zero issues with the recoil. It's working just like it should. Now looking into the spark plug opening into the engine, you can see the top of the piston and there's quite a bit of carbon on it, so we might have to do some cleaning. Now for this task, I'm going to spray some brake cleaner into the engine and let it sit for a while, and then I'm going to pull on the rope a few times. Now this is not the best solution, but it is the one I want to try out first. I'm going to do this a few times and hope that it cleans some of the carbon off the piston. Otherwise, the other option would be to take the engine apart and clean it, which is something I really don't want to do right now. After the third cleaning, I replace the spark plug and see how it works. As you can see, it seems to be working a lot better now. Now the compression is still high, but it's manageable. If I get a chance, I'll have to consider doing a compression test later on. Now that the recoil is working, I think it's finally time to do a test start and see if this is even worth spending our time on. So it looks like we have a working machine and we can continue to work on it. Now if it didn't start, I checked to see if we have a working ignition system which could easily be a bad spark plug or maybe a bad ignition coil. The next thing we need to do is to take the carb apart and inspect it for any issues. Now some of you might be saying that I should just put some fuel into the tank and then try starting it. Unfortunately the fuel lines are completely broken and need to be replaced and the chances are pretty good that if the fuel lines look this bad that the carb probably needs a good cleaning and servicing. After taking off the pumping side of the car, but we can see the round inlet screen. This is there just in case the fuel filter happens to break off the fuel line in the tank, which happens quite often. As you can see, there's quite a lot of debris in the screen, which can only happen if the fuel filter has come off the line in the tank, and that the inlet screen is having to capture all the debris instead. 
The other part we need to check for is the pumping diaphragm, but to be honest, this type of diaphragm material very rarely has any issues, so I don't have any issues reusing it. Now the purge bulb is of course cracked and damaged just like the fuel lines, so we need to replace them, but we'll do that when we put the car back together. The next item we need to check is of course the metering diaphragm. Its job is to control fuel flow through it. Now the diaphragm is supposed to be very soft and pliable, but if it's beginning to harden up, it won't be able to do its job the way it's supposed to. As you can see, it's not completely petrified, but it is beginning to show some signs that it is heading that way. Also, it has a few wrinkles in it, which can get in the way of it working correctly. If I had to rate this one, I would say it was marginal. That means it would be best if we just replaced it. The next thing I want to do is to use my carb adjustment tool to count how many turns it takes to bottom out the screws before taking them out. This will help to put the screws back in the way we found them. Taking out the screws will also help me to clean it the best I can considering I don't have an ultrasonic cleaner, but as you'll see here in a bit, that might be a good thing. After getting the screws out, we need to remove the needle and rocker arm, that way we can safely clean the screen and the entire carb. Just be very careful doing this part, it's so very easy to lose one of these tiny parts, and if you do, the only thing I would recommend is to just replace the carb. Also, don't worry about getting an OEM carb for this machine, a cheap aftermarket one will do just fine. Once the small parts are in a safe place, then we can start to clean the screen, and when the debris is gone and the cleaner starts to flow through the screen, we can start to put the carb back together. If yours is having a tough time flowing through the screen, then let the cleaner sit in the pocket for a while. Come back in a few minutes and then check to see if the cleaner will pass through it again. After that, I'll then start to clear the other passages in the screen, and this is when you'll see why I hesitate to use an ultrasonic cleaner and use it for these types of carbs. So the issue I have with using one is because you have to clean the carb first of any loose debris before you put it in there. The reason is loose dirt and debris might come loose and transfer it to a different part of the carb that you don't want it to be in. You're basically loading up an automatic dishwasher with dirty pots and pans which might allow food debris to transfer to another item and to prevent that you'll have to pre-clean the dishes before putting them in the machine. Once the carb is fairly clean, it's time to put the carb back together, and I'm going to start by putting the fuel adjustment screws back in. Once they stop turning, I'll then turn them out the same number of turns I counted before I took them out. Next, I'll put the needle and rocker arm back into the carb. Now, if you don't think you can do this or you don't want to go through the aggravation, then I would just replace the carb. A new aftermarket carb for this trimmer is only $12, so it's definitely worth it. After getting the rocker arm back into the place, press on it and make sure it moves like it's supposed to. If it doesn't, you'll need to take it back out and try reinstalling it. Now take your time because this part can be very difficult for some. Next, replace the gasket followed by a new metering diaphragm. If you need either a new carb or just the diaphragm, there will be more information about them in the description. Now, when replacing a bulb, if you only buy a single pack, expect to pay over $5 for it, but for only a few dollars more, you can get a multi-pack of three or even five of them. That'll make each one very inexpensive. Unfortunately, we need to replace the fuel lines before we can reinstall the carb back onto the engine. Now, you can reinstall yours if you want to, but as for me, I'm keeping it off to make filming a little bit easier. After dumping out all of the old fuel lines and cleaning out the debris out of the tank, I didn't find a fuel filter. There's a good chance the previous owner took off the filter trying to get the engine to start and run, not realizing just how important it was to have one. The next thing I need to do is to run new fuel lines. Now to make the lines a little bit easier to install, try cutting the lines at an angle. The first line I'm going to run will be the return line, and it doesn't matter which opening you choose for it, that's up to you. After getting the return line installed, I'll then use the same technique, except this time I need to pull the line out of the tank so I can cut the angle piece off and then install the fuel filter. After that's done, I'll then push the line and filter back into the tank and then we'll be one step away from trying to start this trimmer. After cutting the fuel lines to approximate length, I'll then reconnect the throttle cable to the carb and then slide the carb back onto the studs. Now on this particular carb, you need to adjust the throttle cable's anchor, but on most other brands, this is not needed. After checking that the throttle is working like it should and not sticking, we'll install the fuel lines. Now on this particular carb, the fuel filter line will connect to the lower port while the return line connects to the top port. After putting some fuel into the tank, we need to confirm fuel flow through the system before we try and start the engine, otherwise there's a good chance that the engine will not start. So when pressing the purge bulb, fuel will come up the filter line into the carb, partially fill the bulb, and then leave the carb through the return line and back to the tank. After pressing the bulb several times, fuel has finally started to leave the carb through the return line, which is exactly what we wanted. 
Now, before we finish the installation, we need to check for fuel leaks at the carb. Now, this may take a minute or two, but after that time, there's no fuel coming from the carb, so we're safe to finish the installation. Now, if your bulb is not filling with fuel, there might be something wrong inside the carb. If you want to take it apart again, you can, but to be honest, I just replace it. Now, if we have problems getting the engine started or we have issues with keeping it running, we might have to adjust the fuel adjustment screws. Now, the screw closer to the engine is the L screw, and this is for low engine speed fuel adjustment or when squeezing the trigger. Now, the screw closer to the air filter housing is the H screw, and it's for high engine speed fuel adjustment and is used while the trigger is being squeezed. And the Phillips head screw right above them is to adjust the engine's idle speed. Before we start the engine, I need to make sure there's some line coming out of the trimmer head. This will put a small load on the engine. Unfortunately, this one didn't have any line in it, so we'll have to load some, and then once that's done, I'll then start the engine. Now, this engine is big enough that I could probably load thicker line into it if I wanted to, but this is the only one I have right now, so it'll have to do. So luckily the engine started and ran for a second, and even though I could choke the carb and try that again, I'm going to assume the engine is flooded. Now to clear the flood, I'm going to use no choke and then try starting it again. The good news is that it started and ran very well. In fact, I'm happy enough with the way the engine idled and ran at wide open throttle that I don't feel the need to adjust the carb. In fact, the engine sounds surprisingly good as though someone might have ported the engine. It just doesn't sound stock to me. It could be just me, but it sounds like an old school two-stroke from 30 years ago. Now, if you're curious as to why I thought the engine might have been flooded was because it really didn't start the way I wanted it to when it was fully choked. But I will let you know on subsequent cold starts, it has a tendency to flood, so I did have to adjust the carb for a better and more predictable start. Now, this trimmer was really surprising to me, and to be honest, I like the way it sounds, but I don't care for it being a curved shaft and how the engine looks. I sure hope someone doesn't mind because I don't want to keep it and I have plans on selling it. If they don't like the asking price, maybe they'll make an offer. So my question, is this trimmer something you would like to have as a backup trimmer if the price was right, of course? Now, if I saw this trimmer for sale at a garage sale, I would only offer $40 for it, but I know some of you out there wouldn't offer me a dime for it, and I wouldn't blame you. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions about this project or about your own projects, and I hope to see you in the next video.